Hi everyone, I'm Becky from the University of Kent's Institute of Cultural and Creative Industries. This week we are hosting a series of panel discussions looking at creative careers and in today's session we are putting a spotlight on the film industry. So we're really pleased today to be joined by a wonderful panel of people working in this industry in a huge range of different job roles. Um, so we're going to hear from them to get an insight into what their job involves, how they got into their career and their top tips for anyone wishing to pursue a career in this industry. Um, so firstly, I'll just ask the panellists to introduce themselves. So if you could just let us know your name, your job title and the organisation that you're associated with, if that's OK. So Jess, should we start with you? Yeah, so hi, my name is Jess Thomas. I'm Marketing Officer for the Gulbenkian, which is based on the University of Kent campus in Canterbury. Brilliant. And Shani? Um, I'm Shani Mears, and I am the co-founder and head of talent at a creative agency called The Elephant Room. And I'm just going to make a quick disclaimer, like we're not exclusively to film. Obviously, we work with filmmakers and stuff, but it's more within the advertising sort of space. Thank you. Uh, Dominic? Um, yeah, I'm Dominic Plowton and I'm a visual effects compositing supervisor, so I work on the post-production side of um, film and TV, um, currently at a company called One of Us, um, based in London, um, and we work together with uh, a lot of the major studios and things like that on um, various films and TV shows. Thank you. And Emily? Um, hi, I'm Emily Harwood. Um, I'm a set and costume designer for theatre and film. Lovely, thank you. Chris? Uh, I'm Chris, so I'm a um, video content producer um, and I run a company called Spark Film Production, which is based in Canterbury. Awesome. And finally, David. Hi, I'm David Sin. I'm head of cinemas at the Independent Cinema Office. Um, the Independent Cinema Office, or ICO, is the national um, agency that provides support for all kinds of film exhibitors. So film festivals, independent cinemas, film societies, community cinemas, the whole range. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so yeah, our first question is just to ask, what does a typical day look like in your job? Um, so Jess, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. I think I'll probably start off uh, a chain reaction of no day is ever the same in any job. Um, but especially when you're in a small marketing team of two people at a mixed art centre, it's even more varied. Um, my job underneath marketing can encompass everything from press, social media, digital, web design, uh, web comms, uh, communications, uh, marketing, analysing stats and demographics, you name it, we're probably doing it. So whether or not you're picking up a, a brochure uh, from our organisation or just buying tickets online, we've touched it in some way from the marketing team. Cool, thank you. And um, Shani, what about you? Yeah, going back to what Jess said, like no day is the same. And mm -hmm. particularly for, um, for me and my company, I mean, we're a team of six, so more often than not, we have like every day, um, a daily like sort of early breakfast meeting, outlining all the sort of different things that are happening, projects that are live, things that we need to be sort of getting on with. I, I predominantly sort of work in a space where we, I am like constantly looking for talent and talent being graphic designers, videographers, um, producers and things like that um, so I'm meeting at least I'd say eight to nine different types of people in that space a week um, just having catch-ups learning about what they're up to and seeing how we can collaborate um, and if there's any um, room for us to sort of uh, work on any projects um, I also head up a lot of our like sort of initiatives so around the cultural calendar we run a we have like a sub-brand called the creative storytellers where we arrange events and programs that we do. Um, currently we have a mentoring program, which is open for young women and non-binary individuals to be um, mentored by C-suite and senior leaders in the industry, which will kick off in March. Um, and I'm responsible for that. Um, and then building out all our sort of partnerships. So we've also got currently a live um, 
a live briefs, I say partnership that's going with um, the University of the Arts London. So that's kind of me in a nutshell, um, sort of just sort of working out our projects, meeting people and trying to stay culturally in tune with what's popping. Amazing, sounds great, thank you. Um, Dominic? Um, yeah, I guess the same as, as both of uh, the other two, no, no day is really the same. Um, and I guess it also depends in my job on in what stage of the project you're in. Um, so if you're in production or if, if things are shooting at the moment, so there could be times when you as a visual effects artist or a visual effects supervisor or um, something like that would go on set and, and make sure that everything is shot in the way that it, it needs to be in order for you to work on it afterwards properly. Um, so there's, there's those times that you could actually be on set um, during the shoot. Um, and then if you're in um, post-production stage, um, it also depends if you're in, in early post-production or if you're close to the end or like close to delivering, um, depending on what your days look like. Um, but maybe to give you a little bit more of an idea of what it is actually that I do is, um, uh, so working in compositing is essentially combining all of the images, um, as in you have you have something that was shot in camera, and then you get, um, for example, if there was a blue screen or a screen or green screen, you need to replace the background, you need to change out what is what was actually there, or if you have a creature, an animated uh, character, or something like that, and you need to have that interact with uh, the actors or just having it appear in a shot and things like that. So this is kind of the the, the things we do, and then. You will have to do uh, small adjustments every time uh, you get feedback. Where you have reviews with the directors or um, with the with the sometimes with the studio with the um, producers, um, who would then essentially give you the feedback um, for. So at the beginning of the project, you would get briefed what they want, what what do they want to achieve, and then you go ahead and do it, and you have your team of artists that help you achieve that, and then you show it again and present it to the, direct, to the director or to the producers. Um, they end up giving, giving you feedback or they say, hey, this is awesome, this is final. Um, and this is obviously what we always wanna hear, but most of the time that's not the case. And then you essentially give that feedback back to your artist to see what you can do to, to address that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, I think that's sort of the, the most structured um, part of the job, I wanna say, um, but yeah. Wow, yeah, sounds, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, Emily, what about you? Um, all right, similar, <laughs> similar story. There's no, no same day. I think particularly as a freelancer, you're constantly juggling different projects at different stages. So it really just depends where you are uh, with that project. It could be anything from having meetings with your director, uh, the producer, uh, the other crew that you've got involved or even the cast and so on and any other heads off you could have a day just sitting down and researching whatever your design is drawing sketches uh, making little models and so on um, you could have a full-on day just running around looking for props and you know sourcing charity going through charity shops and flea markets and so on or just I'm also quite a hands-on designer so I make my sets as well so I could be building um, and cutting and paint, cutting wood and painting everything. Um, or you could be on, on set itself and just getting it all prepped and ready. Um, I'm also gonna say something really controversial as well, because I don't think we talk about it enough um, in that pretty much the majority of uh, creative freelancers that I know have a side job. They've got a side hustle. Mm -hmm. So the likelihood is you're probably, you could be doing that as well. Um, unless you're financially viable, you're going to be juggling all these different things. And I think there's a big shame that we have in this industry about not talking about the side jobs that you have to sustain your career. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd say it's just absolutely a big part of it. So I just wanted to uh, add that in. Yeah, that's a really good point, because I guess it's important to, yeah, the difference between full time sort of um, being employed by an organisation full time and then freelance. And obviously there's freelance workforce is massive and really important to film industry so yeah just getting that reality of like what a freelance career looks like and that it is a lot of juggling and lots of different yeah different things that's a really good point thank you um Chris uh yeah so yep same as the others I think our work tends to be um a day of the week 
can either be live shooting or it can be an editing day. So I tend to split my time between actually going out and filming or spending days in the office working on projects. Really, if I think about rather than a typical day, if I kind of think about an, an, an average day of the week, it normally involves um, looking ahead at projects that are coming up, making sure that we've got equipment available, we've got a team assembled, that there's anything we need to hire that's already in place, um, that all of like the boring stuff like risk assessments and plans and permissions and all that kind of stuff's all been signed off. Um, and then either I'm actually shooting, which normally means you're the first there in the day and you're the last to leave at night, so they tend to be pretty long days. Um, if I'm editing, then I tend to try and um, split my editing time up a little bit in between other tasks just to keep things fresh and just so that you're not like, you know, getting too bogged down in anything that you're working on. Um, actually, learning is a really big part of my day as well. I tend to dedicate at least an hour a day just to whether that's like just social media or just like looking on YouTube and stuff. Like it's a really current job to do like video content creation for businesses because like trends pass all the time and there's always things that are spoofs of other things or things that are particularly, pop are particularly popular at any one moment in time. So, um, so yeah, just kind of keeping on top of things really is mm. really quite a big part of, of what has to go on. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. And finally, David. Yeah, the risk of sounding boring. I would agree with all the others. There's there's no uh, no two days are the same, um, and I work across a, a whole um, set of different um, activities at the ICO. So um, it's quite difficult to uh, pin it down to a typical a single typical day. I guess I could offer several typical days in a way, but I'll try anyway, just to give you one example. Um, so when I'm mostly working as a programmer, my day might be uh, divided into uh, three, three or four different parts. I might spend, um, let's say, a third of the day thinking about films and uh, working with films directly. So this might involve actually going to view a film, uh, a pre-release preview of, of a new film, or um, it might involve uh, lengthy conversations with distributors about what they have uh, on their release schedule, what they have coming up, what they're going to do with it, uh, what kind of release they're going to give that film. Um, and it's a question for the programmer to um, assimilate a lot of information about um, all the new releases that are on the schedule. Um, I then might spend um, another third of the day uh, speaking to um, the cinemas and thinking about and speaking to the cinemas that we work with. Uh, so the ICO works with um, around about 25, 26 uh, client cinemas that we provide programming um, services to. So we select their films for them and we make their film bookings for them. So uh, again, I might spend a third of the day uh, loosely liaising with, with some of those venues, um, speaking, speaking to them about what their program might look like in a month or two months time um, and then finally uh, in my role I would spend at, probably at least a third of each day uh, managing people and the various teams and activity uh, that we um, that we deliver so making sure that the projects that we're working on are um, are managed and going to deliver on time Mm -hmm. Amazing. Is there is there anything? Because I know you do distribution as well. Um, yeah. Is there just so that we get that perspective? Because it's really great to have this this insight of kind of it's not just about the creative filmmaking side. There's all these other careers around film and cinema, programming, and yeah, distribution. So I don't know if there's anything you can tell us about what that might involve in a in a kind of yeah, what kind of tasks you might do in the distribution side? Um, yeah, I mean, distri distribution is a, is a very sort of project-based um, activity. So it, it, it lurches from one release, one, the release of one film to the next. And each release is different, is slightly different because every film is slightly different. And um, the main thing about distribution is you, you, have, to, uh, you have to think about um, who the audience is for a particular film. And so a lot of time is spent in distribution thinking about uh, how to position the film for that audience, how to, how to enable the film to reach its potential target audiences. Um, and then uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the other activity around distribution is making that happen. So it's essentially a marketing exercise uh, to try to match up the film 
and the release of a film with its intended audience. Mm -hmm. um, but a, ty a typical, I mean, there's no typical day in distribution really, but a, but a sort of typical distribution project might, uh, might roll across um, a two month period from the point where you start thinking about how you're going to release that film and how much money you're going to spend releasing that film to the actual release date. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Really good, really interesting. Um, so yeah, the next question, I just wondered if we could hear a bit about your career pathway. So how did you get into your specific job? And obviously there's so many different routes that people can take. And so these aren't set in stone, but it's just useful to hear a few examples. So um, Jess, can you kick us off with your story? <laughs> Yeah, um, so I actually wound up in marketing somewhat accidentally, I'm going to say that. Um, I, I actually did a drama and theatre studies degree with a specialism in sonography. So that was set design and costume. Um, and it took all of probably one week in total working on Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat for me to figure out very quickly. I didn't have the makings of a dresser and it I didn't want to wash people's dirty underwear. I've got enough of my own dirty underwear. Um, and started thinking about what else I could do. And actually it was uh, a couple of people I talked to who said, well, you're very chatty, you're very confident. Have you ever thought about communications? Um, and that started me looking at communications and what that kind of involved. And I was lucky enough to uh, land a internship uh, position at Shakespeare's Globe. Um, so I spent four months at Shakespeare's Globe then sort of learning the ropes and I just loved it from day one, like everything about it, the struggle um, to persuade people to see things, to challenge, but also like there's nothing like seeing a full auditorium full of people watching a show and just having their minds blown. Um, and that kind of was what really uh, stood out for me is like, this is what I want to do. I want to be a part of that chain that changes people's life because the arts has that impact to do that um but the struggle to get there like to where my job is now like even when I, I did a couple of internships at different places um I was balancing that up against working at Patisserie Valerie so I sold cake on the side that was my side hustle uh so it took a couple of years to kind of get that full-time uh position going um but I just, yeah, I love it. And it was well worth it. And never underestimate the skills you learn selling cake as well. <laughs> they, they do come back. <laughs> cool, thank you. And Shami, what about you? Yeah, I had a little bit of an unorthodox pathway into the industry as well. I mean, my degree is actually in dance performance. So I was also in the arts. I've been dancing for a very long time. Um, but then quickly realised as I was coming to sort of do my dissertation that I wanted to be much more involved in the creative industry as a whole because I really love music and fashion and just culture as it extends and I wanted to be a part of those conversations so I then took a marketing internship after my graduation and um, I went to intern at a global advertising agency and whilst I was at that agency the CEO became my mentor and then 10 months later we left together and started our own agency um which kind of again was like a sort of big change for me as I've never started an agency before didn't do any sort of business studies or anything like that but then what that meant was that it really sort of gave me leeway to carve out what I really want to do and sort of align my passions so kind of like Jess I like talk to people I enjoy I enjoyed um, immersing myself in culture and analysing that. I like linking it back into social politics and culture and how that then relates into my marketing and how people profit off the back of it. Like I'm really interested in those conversations. So what I'm able to do is apply those skills and then connect talent to that. So I also, um, whilst I was working at um, Iris, which was the global advertising agency. I was also the brand and talent manager for GWAP, which is the world's first video magazine. They actually went to Kent University um, okay. when they started that. And that's been going five years. They're now like a global brand and content studio. Um, and I built out the talent there. And then I also started my own network called Girls Let's Talk. So I'd really encourage like 
you know, just doing lots of different things and starting projects. I'm a part-time lecturer now. So I, I work part-time at Kingston um, University. I lecture two days a week. Um, and I do that as a part of like my full-time job because I just feel like everything interlinks the learning and understanding behaviors of people, young people, consumers, et cetera. And then link that back into, again, how you work with brands. So that was kind of my way in, but I, I'd, I'd, I'd say my biggest piece of um, learning though was like, I literally took everything that was different about me and then applied it into a traditional space. And then people learn, I learn, and then we exchanged. And then off the back of that obviously became the agency. So mm. I'd just say to continue to just do lots of different things and learn lots of different things, read a lot and immerse yourself in conversations that you probably never thought that you mm. you're part of. Yeah, definitely. Cool, thank you. Um, Dominic. Um, yeah, mine is also not the most conventional way to get in the industry, but probably a bit more than some of the others. Um, I kind of always knew that I wanted to do film since I was, I don't know, six, seven, eight years old or something like that. Um, uh, I just I, I just didn't know exactly what I was, what I wanted to do within, within film. Um, and then when, when I was about like 15, 16 and stuff, I was very, uh, uh, you know, playing video games and things like that as well and started making my own sort of videos from video games at home. Um, so when it came to like uh, going to uni, I went to, uh, did a digital art course, which was kind of a bit of a broader, um, broader range of things that we would get. So it was um, traditional art and things like that as well. Um, but there was like photography, cinematography, um, and then there was uh, a 3D animation um, uh, module as well. And that's kind of where I sort of stuck in the end, um, which is what I really enjoyed because I could almost make my own films, um, but I didn't have to have a massive crew because I just did animation, animated film basically. So I did um, for, uh, at the end of my degree, basically I did an, it, it did a, um, an animated short film, which ended up uh, getting me, uh, getting my foot into a door um, a, as an intern at an um, animated feature film, a German animated feature film. Um, so I worked there for about seven or eight months as an intern, just kind of learning the ins and outs of uh, 3D modeling and animation and those kind of things. Um, but I always knew that I that actually what I wanted to do is, is live action films, not, not just animation. So I always try to keep learning and um, uh, move into to that um, uh, film uh, or into live action film as well. Um, and I decided to do a master's actually at the University of Kent as well um, in visual effects, um, where it was all focused on live action uh, visual effects. Um, and um, yeah, basically um, the, the, the main thing to get into post-production and visual effects is to have a showreel and to have like, I don't know, a minute or two of like a portfolio of your, your work that you try to then send out to all the different studios and recruiters and everything. And then hopefully someone will give you a chance at an interview. And I ended up actually starting out in advertising because um, yeah, getting straight into film is usually quite difficult, especially straight out of uni because the, the, the quality or like the, the expected, what you're expected to deliver is so high um that you know sometimes there's uh, there's a big a bit of a gap between that um when you when you enter straight out of uni for example um so i found advertising to be a perfect sort of um step in between because it's um it i was working in advertising for about a year year and a half or so um, and you actually work on so many different projects um and i ended up having i think 10 12 different adverts that i could all put on my showreel um, and then with that, I, you know, started applying again to different um, companies um, that worked on film and eventually got in through that. Um, so, yeah, and then since then, I've just kind of been, been, been working in film, really. Awesome. Thank you. It's really useful to have all those different examples as well. Like, yeah, you're so right. It's not just one route. Um, Emily, what about you? Um, so Jess, I think we actually did the same course, <laughs> um, obviously in different years. Uh, but yeah, so the four year um, drama and theatre studies course at the University of Kent and then the fourth year you specialise, which was sonography, which is set in costume design. Um, I then what, moved to London, got myself a part time job managing a box office of a theatre. 
um, and then juggle just trying to apply for any any vaguely designed job I could get. I think my route was more from the theatre side, actually. So um, I predominantly work worked in theatre and still do really um, building those sets and creating those kind of projects with people. Um, as well as you know I've, I've established my own theatre companies a couple of times so kids and like a um another interactive one um so just it was just constantly just applying for different design jobs that I could and just building up your network of people that you've got around you and resources um until I don't know until I've eventually got to the point where all my work is now uh, word of mouth, which is incredible to get from that original state where I just you can never really feel like it's going to happen, that it's never going to get any easier. And it finally does. It all kind of pays off. Every little job I, I've done um, has just kind of fed into this. I've just constantly been trying to pick up little project after project and then sticking with the same groups of people that we actually all really worked really well together kind of just builds on that mm -hmm. yeah brilliant thank you Chris there we go you should be able to hear me now um yeah so I I didn't have a conventional route in at all actually I was um I left school when I was 16 um didn't really go to college particularly I wasn't a very good student so I initially went to do graphic design and art history um didn't feel like I really enjoyed it, didn't really enjoy um, the sort of education space particularly. Um, so I chose not to go to university and I was sort of quite um, bullish, I suppose, and thought I could go my own way and thought I'd get myself kind of like a, a normal job, I guess, is what I suppose the rest of us call it. Um, and to be honest, I really enjoyed it. I worked, like it sounds kind of boring, I worked for an insurance company, but I, I had quite a high, like I'd worked quite hard, like I'd gone through promotion steps and things like that to do a job. That I thought I wanted and thought that other people valued I thought I'd got quite a good point and actually it wasn't until um, I ended up working for a company that I'd spent a couple of years trying to work for and I was about six months into that job and I kind of thought wow like if this if this is the best it will get I'm not quite sure if this is enough for me really I thought you know it took me a long time and a lot of I spent a lot of my commuting time actually thinking you know, I'm not, I'm not totally sure if this is all it was cracked up to be. And when I was younger, you know, camera phones came out and, um, you know, I'm going to show my age now, but Jackass was like a massive thing for me and my school friends. And like, we were always making like stunt videos and prank videos. And I was in a band and we used to make music videos and they were awful, rubbish. I never showed them to anybody. And, um, and they were, you know, they were only ever for us, but I really enjoyed that. I was always the one documenting everything we got up to through our summer holidays and things like that. Um, and I think actually it was possibly my lack of confidence really even though I thought I was being really bullish but actually it was me believing that I didn't think I could make a career out of a creative like something I really wanted to do I sort of felt that I had to do something else um, and so actually I took a little bit of money that I'd been starting to save um, to move out um, and I bought a camera and was dedicating all my spare time to YouTube because, as I say, like there was no formal education there. So I'm basically a YouTube student. Um, I spent a couple of years just learning. And then I had, as Emily mentioned, I kind of had that side hustle that I converted into a main job. So I had about a six month transition where I started producing videos for um, for friends I knew who had businesses and um, and some arts organizations and um, theatre groups and things like that. I was producing videos and trailers for them. Um, and then after about six months, although I was earning nothing like a, you know, nothing like a salary, I realized that it was at least sustainable. And I thought, well, I'm at the point now where I'm being asked to work Monday to Friday and I can't now, I can't get away with just pushing people onto weekends anymore. Like I've actually got to make a decision. Um, and yeah, I mean, luckily my job were great about it. They said, you know, if it all falls to bits, you can come back. Don't worry about it. Um, but luckily it didn't. And I'm like eight years in now. So I think that's why I've got such a strong ethic towards learning because I think I know that it was learning and putting the work in right at the start that got me into a job that I really enjoy now um, and so I feel like that was probably the best thing I ever did so why not keep doing it and why not keep learning really so yeah, yeah that's kind of me really I was um, completely yeah. unconventional but I got here in the end so yeah, yeah. I think that's what we're learning is there isn't a com there isn't really a conventional <laughs> route in and yeah it's really good to hear of like 
you know you don't necessarily have to know what you're going to do at age 16 like you can go into a completely different sector and then change later on like I think that's really good to yeah to hear an example of that thanks um David so I started I started my career many many years ago um in uh in the in the in the pre-internet age and um so in those days obviously the word work was very very different to uh how it is now um and certainly the film industry itself was also very different at that time there was certainly no uh clear career ladders as such so when i uh when i graduated uh with a degree in film from warwick university um uh, the first step I took was to um, to do a kind of internship, a, a rather informal kind of internship, with um, in a in a film theatre, independent film theatre, in my hometown. That was the easiest way for me to um, sort of get into the arts, get into um, an, a, an environment, a work environment that I wanted to be in. Um, and I guess I was very fortunate in that. Um, a matter of weeks after I started the internship, uh, I was offered a temporary uh, but full-time job as a film programmer in a, in a cinema covering for, for the programmer um, who was taking an extended holiday. Um, and uh, I guess one thing led to another in that role and I ended up uh, re re receiving a permanent role, getting a permanent role in that film theatre. Um, and in a way, that's the story of my career since then. I've always, um, uh, I've always taken kind of sideways steps or taken temporary, what, what appear to be temporary roles. Um, and often, uh, in fact, every time they've always, um, they've always turned out to be, uh, turned into more permanent roles um, at every step of my career. So. Uh, over, over, the, over the length of my career, you know, I've worked as a film programmer, uh, I was head of cinemas um, at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London uh, for a few years where I was a programmer and a film distributor. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a strange career and I think because there isn't really a career ladder as such or certainly when I started there weren't very clear career pathways through the film industry, uh, there was a very strong sense that you um, you had to network, you know, very, very strongly, especially at the beginning of your career. And through through creating your networks, you would create for yourself some kind of career ladder uh, onto which you could uh, you could climb. Um, I think mine was quite wobbly, my career ladder, but but it kind of worked out in the end. Um, and I think you also have to, uh, the sort of lesson I've learned from, from my career so far is that you also have to really take the opportunities when they present themselves to you. So um, uh, if, you, if you want to kind of move on in the film industry, it's best not to overthink it when, you, when you're offered an opportunity and uh, to kind of seize it. Um, if it doesn't work out, you can always, you know, at a later stage, take a sideways step again and try and try and rejoin um, at a later stage. But uh, I think you have to kind of grasp the opportunities when they present themselves. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was going to, my last question was going to be about kind of your top tips for people getting into the industry, but I think we have kind of shared quite a few of those just with that. So, um, but if any, has anyone got any final thoughts or like top tips that you'd throw in that we haven't already mentioned any other thoughts um i'd say i mean the only the only thing i see a lot potentially is that with the best will in the world i often get a lot of emails every week from young people who want to do work experience or they want to come and work with us or they want to know if they, we've got jobs available and things like that and as much as i'd love to reply to everyone and offer some really good like um words of encouragement it's really tricky and actually an email can be quite a cold form of contacting um i think actually the best you know the sort of the people who we've ever worked with are often the ones who call they'll come up and talk to us when we're out filming and things like that they've often um been really proactive and produced work already and they've got something to show me if i'm busy you know they'll ask if there's a time that they can call me back and like it's just persistence really and i think it's um i think that's kind of it i think when you're you know when you're working day to day 
you can spot a, a blanket email a mile off like you know if I feel like I'm just getting something that a hundred other people are getting then it's it's quite difficult and I think actually it's probably quite wasted effort really I think if you really are passionate and you really want to do it then I think pick carefully and really go for it I think and really be persistent and work for it yeah that's good advice I think definitely absolutely I was just gonna say um I think particularly when you're like younger you're a part of a generation where everyone's like interconnected so I'd really encourage people to like just find their tribe like the likelihood of you looking for a role is the likelihood there's someone else looking for that same role and next thing you know there's like 10 15 20 of you and someone's got one skill you can skill swap and you can make projects you can brainstorm you and all those things like one you won't feel alone and two you'll feel like actually anything that you're creating you already have that sort of um I'll say like soundboard that you can sort of bounce off and stuff and then when you are approaching people like Chris and going to them you're like yeah and I've got these group of people and I already like even if you wanted to build a team you already know how you're going to build that team because you've got the network to do so and it really just show that proactivity and you'll feel so much more passionate and motivated to do what you're doing and I think that's really important to continue to just sort of pursue lots of different things I always say trial and error and fail fast like we just like just try it like you, the worst that could happen it just doesn't work and that's okay because at least you know you've done it and then you move on to the next and I still apply that in my sort of everyday life as well so I just think it's important to like not be afraid of taking risk and don't wait for perfection because there's no such thing mm-hmm. brilliant yeah thank you um I would I would just also like to add to that as well is just to um say uh, to the whole perseverance thing and um just make sure you don't um it is a very very competitive industry in general so make sure you don't just um uh kind of get stuck in a place where you think oh i'm i've done this and this i've done my uni degree or something and now it's time for me to send out application and that's it and then i'm just waiting for them to call me back because that's that's most likely never going to happen, really, um, unless you're really, really good straight out of, I don't know, uni or where, where, whatever stage you're at and you're just about uh, at the right place at the right time. Um, but most of the time, that's not really going to happen. So um, what you can't really do is just assume that once you've done that, you're just, you know, sitting there and waiting for for them to give you a call. It's more about like, you know, keep working on your skills, keep improving them, do your own projects on the side um, and just keep working it up. And then sometimes even if you've if you've applied at a, at a studio, for example, a half a year ago or a year ago, and you've got if, if a year later they, they have another position um, open, for example, and you start applying to them and they see, oh, this guy's applied before. Oh, this is exactly the same reel that we've seen a year ago. Then they're like, oh, what has this guy, what, what, what has that person been up to over the past year? But if you constantly keep, you know, sort of learning as well yourself, just working on your own project, being able to just um, skill up essentially and just make yourself more employable in general, um, and people, people will start noticing that even, even if there's hundreds of applicants and stuff, if the same name shows up three, four, five times um, and every time what you see from them, it looks better then you're like, hey, we should really get this guy and, and eventually you'll, you'll probably get there. So it's, it's essentially don't be discouraged when you hear no's or when you hear nothing as well, like uh, Chris was saying, like you don't always get an email back. Most of the time you don't. And so just don't let that discourage you. And just if you really want it, if you're really passionate about it, just, just keep at it. And eventually, um, I guess it, it will happen. So. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Oh, have you got one, Emily? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to say, like, squeeze as much as you can from each experience and opportunity you have. Um, and that could be from, like, chatting to every other crew member on on the team you know chat to the sound guys chat to the lighting people speak to costumes you know work your way around you're gonna gain stuff from every opportunity you do even if it's a terrible little project that you're on you're gonna still learn something from that get as much experience as you can and then squeeze it for that opportunity um and also if if you are starting out it is 
it is just really hard. I'm going to say it. Being an any kind of artist in any field is really hard. There's no direct career path at all. Um, so you are going to struggle. And just, just remind yourself that there is this idea of faking it till you make it. But embrace that. You are whatever role you want to be. Um, and just do that. Um, don't feel bad about that. That's just what it is. Um, and don't compare yourself to anyone else that may have started, finished the same degree at you and are, are doing much more better at, at, on their path. There's no point comparing because everyone's going to be faced with different opportunities um, at their doorstep at any different time. Um, you will get there. OK, so just don't be hard on yourself. Just have fun with it. You'll find something that you, because you've met someone five years ago, they'll come back to you and someone else won't have that opportunity. So don't don't fall into that mindset of comparing someone's doing better. You're, you're going to get there. Absolutely. If you just really want to, you will. I love it. Nice bit of inspiration there. <laughs> I just to pick up on two things that Shani and Emily have kind of been saying about uh, failure and sort of like, don't be afraid of failure. And something somebody once told me when I was quite early on in my career was fail forward sort of twist it on its head and like no decision is a bad one if you learn from it like and if you make a mistake like we all make mistakes and it's what you, if you own up to it put your hands up to it and then what are you going to do about it that often earns you more respect more credibility and like informs your skill set in a better way than just accepting the failure because you can always go back to something or reuse something brilliant cool I think we we'll leave it there but um thank you so much to all of you for yeah sharing your stories and all your advice with us it's been really really helpful and interesting um and yeah thank you everyone for watching as well and I hope this has helped to give a bit of an insight into obviously this is just a few examples of, of yeah many possible careers in this industry but hopefully it's been helpful um if you have any comments or questions if you've got questions for any of our panelists we can pass those on so don't hesitate to get in touch. You can email icci at kent.ac.uk or contact us on Twitter at Unikent ICCI or Instagram at Kent ICCI. Um, there's going to be a slide coming up after this video with all of those contact details on there. So yeah, feel free to drop us a line, ask any questions. And yeah, thanks again to everyone for taking part and watching. Bye. <laughs>